Board of the Mississippi Center for Justice. And, and I cannot tell you how happy I am to have the privilege of introducing tonight's Mississippi on the Potomac honoree, Walter Dellinger. Looking out, looking out, I see many of you who know and love Walter, and I know you're here to honor him and celebrate him. And we thank you for being here, and we thank you for supporting the center. Now, I want to talk about what's really important about Walter Dellinger. But before I do that, I've got to get a few basic facts out on the table. So let me go through the basic facts about uh, Walter Dellinger. Basic fact number one, Walter is one of the great public servants of our era. He served as Solicitor General. 1996-97 term of the Supreme Court, argued nine cases that term, a feat I tried to duplicate one year and it damn near killed me. But before that, he served for three years as Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ, and his opinions from that time in the office as the lead counselor for the President in the executive branch are still touchstones for resolving the hardest constitutional questions that the executive branch confronts may not be exactly true now, but it will be once again, I'm sure. Basic fact number two, Walter is one of the great Supreme Court advocates of our era. He's argued dozens of cases in the court. He's won landmark victories. And the two cases he's most justifiably proud of, which tells you something about Walter, are Brown against Legal Foundation of Washington, which established the constitutionality of using lawyer trust funds to finance legal services, Jackson v. Birmingham, which recognized the rights of coaches and teachers to sue for retaliation under Title IX when they were fired for opposing unequal treatment for women's sports teams. Basic fact number three, Walter is one of the great private practitioners of our era. After leaving the government, he founded an appellate practice at O'Melveny that very quickly became one of the nation's best and nurtured the careers of many of the legal superstars of the next generation. Next basic fact about Walter, he's one of the great constitutional scholars of our era. He's the Douglas B. Maggs Professor of Law Emeritus at Duke Law School. Generations of students have benefited from her superb teaching. And over his career, he's produced an enormous body of powerful constitutional scholarship. And as Walter may tell you, after graduating from Yale Law School, he started his career teaching law, constitutional law, at the University of Mississippi Law School. Next basic fact about Walter, he's one of the great public intellectuals of our era. Whenever this country is wrestling with a legal issue of great importance, Walter's honest and wise and progressive voice will be enriching the public discourse, whether it's on Twitter, or the op-ed pages of the Times and the Post, MSNBC, and it's in tru as true now with the question of impeachment looming before us, as it was in the middle of the great debates over civil rights and reproductive freedom decades ago. And most important basic fact about Walter, he's one of the great champions of justice of our era. From his very first days in Mississippi to today, he's been fighting for justice, access to justice for the poor, reproductive freedom, voting rights, and so much more. So, you know, you take a step back and think about that, that's like half a dozen lifetimes worth of amazing achievement uh, in one person. Uh, and you know that's plenty to uh, justify honoring Walter tonight. But those are just the things Walter has done. And those of us who know him uh, know that what is best about Walter by far is not what he has done, but the person he is. And those who, of us who have been blessed to work with Walter know that there is no better or wiser colleague. When I needed guidance as SG, Walter was always the best source of that guidance. I turned to him for advice on every important case, health care, marriage equality, reproductive freedom, you name it, everything of consequence. And Walter always put everything aside to help me, and his advice was always unbelievably helpful. Those of us who know Walter uh, also know that there is no better mentor than Walter. Uh, his practice at O'Melveny, as I said, it uh, was, a, was a launching pad for 
incredible generation of young lawyers, Judge Srinivasan, Judge Harris with the Fourth Circuit, Irv Gornstein, who runs the Georgetown Supreme Court Advocacy Program, John Hacker runs Melvinese Appellate Group, Jeremy Malfi, who's now the managing partner of O'Melveny here in DC, and so many more, all came to fruition under Walter's guidance, which was an amazing thing. And those of us who have been blessed with his friendship know that there is no, no truer or more steadfast friend than Walter. Uh, for me, that really came home when the slings and arrows were flying after the healthcare arguments uh, in 2012. Walter was right there by my side. And it was true not just in private, uh, but in public. And it was not true just after the decision came down, but before. So Walter, it has been one of the great blessings of my life to know you, have you as a friend. And we at the Mississippi Center for Justice salute you as a great public servant, a superb Supreme Court advocate, an unmatched private practitioner, a deep constitutional scholar, an engaged public intellectual, a champion of justice, and a cherished colleague, mentor, and friend. Thank you for letting us honor you tonight. In June of 1966, Ann and I left uh, New Haven in a Volkswagen Beetle and headed south, way south, uh, to Mississippi. Uh, I was going to teach political and civil rights and constitutional law to the one of the beginning integrated classes at the University of Mississippi, and Ann taught survey of English, English literature. She had most of the Sugar Bowl team in her class, and her generosity enabled several of the key performers <laughs> to be on the field that day. Riley Morse's uncle, cousin in Mississippi, nobody counts, uh, was the dean, uh, often rumored to be a communist, but that term was used loosely in those days who recruited a group of us from Yale Law School to come down there. I, I've, I've wondered in thinking about this evening what, what led me to Oxford, Mississippi. There are many sources. Uh, the guidance of my older sister, who is, uh, whose devotion to equal justice taught me a lot. Um, after my father passed away when I was 11 and my little sister was uh, five, Barbara was our moral guidance. I do remember reading James Baldwin. Don, you sent me a nice note after I wrote the piece the day the Baldwin documentary was up for an Academy Award. And what really was striking to me was I was reading Baldwin while working construction on a segregated uh, work site uh, in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I read a passage where Baldwin had made his first trip south. Here is a gay black intellectual and writer from Harlem and Paris. He makes his first trip to the south. When the ministers in Charlotte put him on the plane, they say to head into the deep south, they say, you've seen Charlotte, but Charlotte isn't really the south. And I was very proud for a moment until I turned the page and Baldwin's next sentence was, Charlotte, by God, was southern enough for me. <laughs> but Mississippi beckoned me in part because, Bald because of what Josh Morris wanted to do as dean, to, to create an African-American bar in the state of Mississippi um, and to make the law school, as it was for a brief shining moment, a, 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 a a site of advocacy for social justice. Um, it was also Baldwin saying that, you know, 
white people, you need to work on white people. That's where our problem is. Uh, the essays I read by Baldwin were reflected in uh, what Chris Rock was later to say. That there's no such thing as a race relations problem. We have a, a problem that white people are crazy. <laughs> and now they're a little less crazy. And, and, and that's progress. But that's where, so I thought that, that, that uh, uh, if I went down, uh, I was one of the two Southerners in the group that Josh Morris recruited. I think I had the deeper Southern accent at that moment. So I was the one that had to teach political and civil rights. We had some great students. Reuben Anderson went on to a distinguished judicial career in Mississippi. Um, I do. I was told quietly by one of my students that another student in the class was secretly taping my lectures and sending the cassette every night to the White Citizens Council uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. And so for the next class, I got to a point where I said, now, for those of you who are listening down in Jackson, <laughs> this next point, pay attention, this next point is really important. So I want you to pay close attention. And I'll repeat it slowly. Okay? <laughs> you know, I thought if we were to be one nation, Mississippi had to be a part of that. It was no, what makes me especially moved tonight is I know our long, our relationship through George Riley, my, my deceased old Melvin e. partner has supported the Mississippi Center, which makes this a, a, a special honor. But also one of my colleagues there was Mike Christer. Mike had the bestest, goodest connection to social justice of any person I have ever known. And what Mike did, uh, after I left to go clerk for Hugo Black, Mike and, and George Strickler started the North Mississippi Rural Legal Services Project. Uh, his courage uh, and the depth of his integrity have always been a beacon for me. Well, I'll, I'll close with this. I, uh, the day I was born, May 15th, 1941, Joe DiMaggio, who had uh, gone hitless the day before, got a single in the second inning in an otherwise meaningless game, except for the fact that he got a hit the next day, and the next day, and day after day, day after day throughout the summer of 1941, uh, gripping the whole nation with the greatest streak in the history of all of sports. And when I saw that it began the day I was born, the very day, May 15, 1941. I reflected back on the fact that on the day I was born and DiMaggio started his streak, no person of color was allowed to play any major league sport. Uh, I think nearly a third of Americans said they would support some legal restrictions on Jews. Gay men and women were subject to arrest, prosecution, imprisonment. Um, in that time, though, we were, I was clearly by far the poorest kid in my high school class. Because I was white, I had access to the public life of the community. Um, I went to the same public schools as the richest kids in town. And the public librarian helped me find the books I needed to read. I, I realized that that was the the special quality of being white, but it was also quality of the openness that we've lost. We've lost the openness that allows people to move uh, uh, throughout our culture. And I, I, I worry that uh, a child growing up today would not have the same wonderful opportunities that I had, including the wonderful opportunity to be with you all tonight and to thank you very much for this great honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you.